Good afternoon. My name is Maria Perrotta Berlin, and on behalf of SITE, the Stockholm Institute of Transition Economics, I'm very pleased to welcome you all, you who are here and all of you who are joining us online to this seminar. We are here to discuss a strategy to help Ukraine win the war. Uh, we, together with some guests of honor. And I'm really deeply honored and humbled to share the stage with our guests today. Let me quickly introduce them to you. So with the exception of Turbjörn Becker, who is the uh, director of SIT uh, and of late a tireless champion of support to Ukraine in Sweden, as well as in several international fora. All of them come more or less directly from Kiev. Timofey Milovanov and Natalia Shapoval represent KSE, the Kiev School of Economics. Timofey is the president of the school, as well as former minister of economic development, trade and agriculture of Ukraine. And Natalia is the vice president for policy research and head of KSE Institute. Formerly their academics, However, we can well say that since the start of the war, their everyday life is not really looking like the normal day-to-day -day of academics, uh, even as involved in policy as they were already before. Now, they, together with the KC team, have really stepped up and uh, to support their government and their country in so many more ways. It is really such a source of inspiration and all to listen to them talk about all the things they do, um, we, which we will do in a few short minutes. And also here with us today is Andreas Umland, who is an analyst at the Stockholm Center for Eastern European Studies at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs, and was also, be, uh, was also long, for a long time based in Kiev. So we can say that Andreas represents the links that already are strong and we hope to build even stronger between Sweden and Ukraine within academia, which is our territory, but also beyond that. So I think it's appropriate perhaps to start by asking first our external guests to tell us something about what is life looking like in Kiev right now and what's your work looking like right now. Perhaps we can ask Natalia to start. Um, good evening, everyone. Yeah, so we just uh, came from Kiev, and uh, yeah, I'm a bit nervous. Um, so uh, uh, at KC, basically from the second day of the war, we started, you know, figuring out how we can help out. And uh, Timothy Milovanov, who is our president, will tell more about the overall picture. Uh, but I will start from how we started working with the government, with the policy questions that we could identify. Exactly the second day of war, Timothy write uh, to some of our policymakers asking, so what we can do? And uh, with that point of time, we started working basically on sanctions, proposing what we can do on this economic front, but also on evaluation of the damages to Russian economy. So in this last, more than half a year we've been focusing on that and i hopefully yeah it will the strategies will succeed so getting to this question discussion today is even before this uh, had been that ukraine economy gonna fall economy again before this even like two months ago or something the estimates would be like something between 10 percent to lose the GDP you know, uh, organizations like IMF, World Bank, they would be saying something like percent. So I don't believe in these estimates of 5% or something, but that's another discussion. The big point is that Ukrainian economy is falling much faster. And then with this air strikes on the energy, infrastructure is going to be falling even more because before we came, we would have on average four hours of electricity during the day time. 
and like the rest of time we wouldn't have electricity so we can all, all of us can work something that is not just you know laptop or or phone where you just you know can do your work as analysts it's even more uh, damaging so it means that for the next year and already now it's critical to come up with solutions that would help ukrainian economy to sustain at you know better pace than it had been this year so we cannot allow you know that ukraine economy loses half of gdp and hope that it can sustain as it was even this year and for russian economy the same our sanctions and strategy should be such that it is more effective now it's like eight months of the war all there were there had been like eight packages of eu to sanction dual use goods and now we observe iron drones hitting ukraine so that you know it's it says that our work wasn't effective enough so with uh, these uh, estimates it means that first ukrainian economy should be mobilizing for the military effort more effectively than before secondly it means that ukraine should get more sustainable financial support from the partners and it means according to estimates before we knew how much energy infrastructure is destroyed we were uh, estimating that it would require like 50 billion dollars for the next year to ukrainian economy to sustain which would cover the budget deficit of approximately 38 billion dollars and the rest like rapid recovery and uh, all kind of changes during the year that could come because of the macro shocks and because of the changes in the exchange rate for example but now these figures are likely to be even slightly more for uh, next year and this money are pretty so it's pretty clear how it's composed basically right now ukrainian budget is twice as higher than it had been before the war it means that we have one budget to finance our you know as always health care teachers etc but on top of that we have another budget of the approximately the same size to finance salaries to the military and all kind of military expenditures and this is how these numbers have been calculated for uh, next year then on the sanctions front uh, again we had this discussion with Thorben just a few minutes ago about what else should be done and uh, unfortunately a lot of trade is not yet sanctioned if we look at eu for example uh 60 percent if we take it like out uh, oil would be under uh, sanctions to import from russia but other 40 percent would not be under sanctions and in some cases there would be some serious reason for that in other cases there wouldn't be serious reason for that and uh, it means that trade should be more under sanctions but uh, also we are calling for and we are also part of the Yermak McFall International Working Group of Sanctions and Timothy and Turban and uh, uh, myself uh, this is a group established by the president of Ukraine and 100 academics around that uh, and former diplomats so one of the things that we suggest along with trade sanctions are kinds of state sponsor of terrorism sanctions where including Russia into blacklist of FAT so that more massively transactions with Russia are in under very high scrutiny. So, uh, and before we go, I would like to highlight some other things that we all can be doing, not waiting for, you know, big IMF or government guys to support Ukrainian effort is what uh, KC Charitable Foundation is doing. Before the war, for example, they were collecting scholarship for students, but now they collect, you know, pretty small, I would say, contributions to repair bomb shelters for school. So it's like $10,000 and the whole village can go to school, which I think is amazing. And I guess for the next year, we all can do much more of things uh, of that kind. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia.
perhaps Timofe can follow up on this. Uh, if Ukraine is going to own reconstruction, we cannot let eco the economy collapse now. So what are the needs right now? How do you see them met? If you want to. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, okay, so the question is if what should be done right now with Ukraine so it can with the economy of Ukraine. The war economy is simple. Um, you basically have to fire, you know, you have your GDP, which is equal consumption plus investment plus government expenditure. You don't have any investment. So investment is zero. Then cons private consumption goes down because the preferences change. I don't go to a spa service anymore. I'm happy to have heating in my house. You know, industries like tourism collapse, and we can go industry by industry, right? Um, and at the same time, government expenditure goes up because you have three areas. One is uh, military. Second one is critical infrastructure, energy. We, I don't take light, having light here for given. I don't take it. It's not, it's not, for, for, it's not for granted anymore. Um, and... Um, Water in toilets, excuse me for making it vivid. That's not given. And if it's not given, you have all kinds of hygiene issues. So it's it's very quickly go back to kind of medievalish feel that a little bit more, you know, several more hours without water or light, electricity and the society can collapse. You start thinking about, you know, whether we should change, uh, you know, transfer our university into a shelter where we're buying sleeping bags, we're buying, you know, mats where we can, you know, like uh, stockpiling on water. Um, thinking about putting water towers like they are in the US everywhere. <laughs> now I understand why you want the water tower. It looks uh, ridiculous to me every time I visit New York and I look at this tower, thing, water tanks. Now I don't think they're ridiculous anymore. Um, so you have to support that. And then the third one, you have to support people. Basically, social expansion. It's a very simple economy. It's very resilient in that sense, because whatever business is operating is operating. You know, there are these guys who are repairing uh, electricity, power grid under shelling. And, you know, we daily read how, you know, imagine now you're an engineer. You're sitting in a, you're just an engineer or a, you know, dispatch or someone who is like, you know, just a guard sitting in a power plant. That's a dangerous job, right? Because you, you know, a missile can land there. And so people go and do their jobs daily. Paramedics, you know, they come to treat wounded and then other new missiles come for the second wave of missile comes. So all these jobs now, you know, like it, I, Kind of in the US when I was a grad student, I remember my, my classmate, Emily Blanchard, who is now working in DC as an economist as a, for the government. She, we were discussing why paramedics and uh, firemen in the US are held by the site in such a high respect. We were kind of arrogant young kids who were looking down on other professions. I understand now why those professions in Ukraine are gonna be heroes for decades to come. <clears throat> um, so how do you maintain the economy during the war time? You provide scarce resources. Scarce resources are dollars or euros for us, not hryvnias. We can print hryvnias, but hryvnias don't, doesn't buy ammunition. We're just having this discussion on, on highway, <laughs> on, on the subway, right? that um, about sexism in military and um, kind of West Plain in sexism. When our military female officers come up to a CNN or BBC and they've been asked, how is it to be a woman in military? And they say, we need more bullets and ammunition. And I say, yeah, we understand that, but, but how is it to be a woman? And they're like, but we need guns. And that's the kind of, you know, that's how it feels. You know, you ask us questions, how is it to maintain economy? And I'm like, you know, we need guns. 
guys. We need guns because we are out of munition. You know, it's a lot. It's a it's a serious war. Seven percent of our buildings, residential bu buildings, have been destroyed or damaged. Seven percent. And it's only a part of a country has been under war, 20 to 30 percent. That means there everything is destroyed. So just imagine every tenth building, like every tenth building is destroyed. We have a program. We don't talk about losses, but we have a program of MBA program for veterans after 2014, 2016. And in that program, we had 150 to 120 graduates. Two thirds of them got mobilized, volunteered after the war, uh, after the war started. 10 of them have been killed in action. It's like 7% of an alumni, of our alumni body in a program, in an MBA program. That takes toll on everyone. So, you know, it's simple. We need weapons. It's not a theoretical exercise anymore, you know, could we have a diplomatic solution, you know, or could we have avoided the war? It would have been great to live in a different world, but today civilians and uh, military essentially are dying daily. And every hour of this discussion about expert controls and technology and something and how to coordinate between Switzerland and Germany on some in critical input in a howitzer, that means lives of Ukrainians and including my friends. It comes home very quickly. So I have, I have, um, I have two sisters and uh, uh, my, uh, my big sister husband is from Donetsk and in 2014, he fought, he's a Russian speaking, he's from Donetsk and he fought against separatists. And on the first days of the war, you know, he's decommissioned because he has been, he has concussions, multiple, uh, you know, he's like in 60s really. So he, he, he calls up his friends and he goes and they take a tank, which is used in the military academy downtown Kyiv. They fix up that tank and they just roll it out of the academy to defend a corner. We have a, we run, now run a foundation, a KEC foundation, which used to be before the war, as Natalia said, foundation for education. But we have been recently, you know, uh, reached out to by people from the academy saying that all the weapons that we had, all the howitzers, all the mortars, all the tanks from military academies are in the front lines. We have nothing left. So they're asking us to buy mortars that new cadets can train. So what does the economy need during the war? It needs weapons to stop the war as soon as possible. Okay, so that's the first, I, I think we have to instill the sense of urgency. Now, there is a question, can we have peace, a ceasefire at least? The problem with that is it's a very appealing notion that somehow we can wake up in the world free February 24. We, we want, the world has changed. Maybe not everyone has realized that, but your government is increasing the defense budget. Times, I think. I don't know specific numbers, but across Europe, we're talking about billions, tens of billions and hundreds of billions of dollars. I see recruitment campaigns in your subway. It wasn't there when the last time I visited. It's everywhere, military, you know. It's the same in other countries. This machine started moving on both sides. And to just pretend it's not moving is, is, is a self-denial. The question is, what can we do? Can democracies have a proper, effective answer to guarantee security in Europe at least? And I don't think there is an answer. So I think the security frameworks have failed. So the United Nations, NATO have been built up or created to prevent exactly this kind of thing from happening. And Russia has hacked it because it moved from, you know, they have been built for a discrete warfare, you know, invasion, Article 5, 
zero one. What Russia has done, it has learned to do it in a continuous, you know, way, one step at a time, gradual escalation. They actually bombed Georgian cities. I didn't know it. I didn't know, so I'm guilty of being ignorant. In 2008, Russia bombed, used missiles to bomb civilians in Georgia. They're not doing anything new, it's just the scale is different. Have they committed war crimes before? Yeah, absolutely, Chechnya. Two wars in Chechnya. Horrible things, right? So there is nothing new in the playbook. It's just the scale. And so when we say about ceasefire or solution or peace or something, are we talking about sustainable peace or we're talking about stopping the current dynamics? We can stop, but it's temporary. It's like alcoholism. Someone is sick. Russia is sick. We can try to stop it, you know, don't drink tonight, don't be violent tonight, but that doesn't solve the problem of tomorrow. The moment I'm going to look away, the pattern will repeat. So the question is, how are you treated? How do you stop the disease? And I don't think there is an answer. So we are fortunate to have great leadership right now, historic leadership in Ukraine. It's for the first time in two or 300 years, we have government which is with the people, pro-Ukrainian government. Because in all previous wars and conflicts, our government was either colonial or was corrupt, and it was immediately kind of cutting deals and selling out Ukrainian sovereignty. So that's why this time for us, it's different, but everything Russians do is reminiscent of what they've done to us in the previous century, what Stalin has done to us, what Lenin has done to us. I remember teachers, my teachers of math in 80s, when I was in, in, you know, in finishing school, they were telling me stories how they were afraid between classes to step out to a cafe because they could have been stopped on the streets in 80s by KGB guys during the Soviet Union time and just simply interrogated why they're not at work during the... That was the society, that was considered to be normal. I moved to study to the US because I didn't want to live in that society. And when I came back in 2014, that was a different society in Ukraine. That's a democratic, it's a teenage democracy with all its problems. Like, you know, you all have, you know what teenage problems could be. We have them and more but it's a democracy. And now these guys are crushing the democracy, but I think, uh, you know, they've been doing, if you look at this, they've done Chechnya, they've done Moldova, they've done uh, Georgia, uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Kazakhstan, Belarus. That's a pattern, you know, and they would not have been able to attack Ukraine the way they do it had they not taken Crimea, right? And had they not suppressed Belarus and had they not uh, got Kazakhstan on their side because of energy supplies. So it's not, Ukraine is not, we're all looking at Ukraine as a Ukraine. It's not a Ukraine. They've been doing it in a very systemic, in a very pragmatic and strategic way, ensuring that they can put pressure on us from the north, ensuring that they can put pressure on us from the south, not just from the east, and even from Moldova, from the west, stretching us thin, and then making sure that Kazakhstan cannot provide our alternative supplies of gas. to alleviate the, uh, the energy crisis. So, so I think it's important to help economy of Ukraine during the war, because if Ukraine collapses, it's just gonna be time until the next episode. And we just can only guess whether it's gonna be Moldova, Baltics, uh, Georgia, you know, something in stands, you know, uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, you know, any of this, you know, they will keep collecting land. They, their objective function is not welfare. Their objective function is territory. Not even their own humans, you know, not their own. They put people in, you know, in tanks so they know they will die. They send them and we shoot them using your weapons, you know, and laws. They die there. They know it and they put more kids into the tanks, in old tanks, in older tanks, and they send them to die. So, it's something which is very difficult for us to understand. It's like, it's difficult for us to understand the mind of an alcoholic or a drug addict. And it's very difficult, you know, it seems rational to reason. Why don't you stop? 
Why? It makes it's win-win for everyone that you stop. But they don't, right? So, so I think we have this problem. It's this more serious problem than we, we tend to think of this as an isolation. It was Belarus, it was Georgia, it was Ukraine. It's not. It's a bigger problem. They're connected, these dots. So that's one thing. Therefore, it is important to support Ukraine because, frankly, and very pragmatically, the world is lucky that somehow Ukraine has decided to fight. Okay, because otherwise it would have been on the border with Poland, you know, some pro-Russian regime or something like that. And who knows what would be next, you know. So it's just, and it's ex extremely efficient for you to stop Russia using Ukraine. Because the amount of funds you're gonna invest in energy and in weapons and in defense and this, you know, diverted from education, science, social support is just, you know, it's peanuts, this 50 billions of dollars that, uh, you know, Ukraine needs. So that's on the macro level. On the micro level, I think um, the challenges are critical infrastructure. Everything is related with critical infrastructure as the challenge, you know, weapons and that, 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 that. but, you know, basically, you know that we have run out of stingers, right? You don't, right? The world has run out of stingers already. Already. Air defense are thin because they are thin, not because someone is unwilling to give them. And you see what Russia is doing, they're targeting the entire area. So if we were gonna be thinking about protecting Baltics or Poland, we're not ready. We're not ready. It's our hope that no one will attack. It's just our hope. It's our belief. There is no technology. There is no capacity at this point to protect. Plus, caliber missiles, uh, Kinjal, and others. There is no technology to. They're supersonic, hypersonic. It's difficult to intersect them, intercept them. So the situation is difficult. It's serious. And I think uh, Ukrainian economy, uh, basically during the war is very simple. You just need to support military people and uh, maintain human capital inside country so that there is something to rebuild. Afterwards, you know, it's like, it's like a plant roots. You know, you have to keep the roots there so that it can grow back, right? Um, in every industry, you don't want any industry to be fully destroyed. So you need to maintain the industries. Uh, the companies which uh, survive there and, and, you know, they are thriving many, you know, like Kiev School of Economics, we, we have more students than the last year. We have more fundraising. We have these activities. We're scaling up maybe 10 times than relative to what the previous year was because we, there is a cause and we meet that cause. So people are coming to support. So a lot of, you know, it was bizarre on the first day of the war, we were traveling together, jets are flying and, you know, is it our jets, not our jets. We need to pick up water because it seems to be a natural thing to pick up water. So we go to the, to the uh, supermarket, you know, and there are these people at supermarket who are taking your carts, you know, and selling food and bringing water and jets are flying over. They're not packing, they're not going home, you know. They're getting you waters that you can, you can evacuate. So some, some retail networks that too are like that. They stayed and they continued to operate. Post office, you know, it's another amazing story. That guy I told my sister, my, my, my big sister husband, he gets on this tank and he doesn't have any warm clothes and it's winter, you know, it's February. So we deliver it, we bought, we bought online warm clothing and we deliver it to Kiev by Ukrainian FedEx, Nova Posta. And then one of our analysts just pick up and drove in the middle of this with a car from a post office to the tank to bring him, you know, warm clothing and food. It's just, it's, it's very difficult to, to, you get used to it. I, I told this story early and I'll wrap up. I'll tell this story in the story, uh, early in the meeting that, you know, when the first missiles landed in Kiev, in Kiev, I was completely, you know, shocked and overwhelmed. Last week, remember, I was like, there were missiles and I was going to do a shower. I'm like, explosion, another explosion. I'm like, looking in the window, like, I'm gonna go in the shower before the water is off. 
So you basically get used to it. All right, so, so Ukraine needs support. This is not something we want other countries. No one, you don't want anyone else to experience that. We're all traumatized, we're all PTSD. When if we don't admit it, we might be in denial about this. But I think Europe is in denial about how big of a problem we are facing now. It's a coordinated, comprehensive set of activities by a dictatorship or authoritarian regime with an extremely aggressive military power, which uses military power to its foreign policy aims. And that's the previous century. It's 100 years ago. That's it. It's not the 21st century. So that's a problem. That's a real problem. And it's in your backyard or you know, it's your neighbor. Unfortunately, it's our neighbor. There's a joke from 2014 that Russia demands when they ask what, what, what are the demands of Russia? Russia demands that Ukraine move its, its borders away from Russia. That's the demand. Because whenever we have borders with them, they feel threatened, therefore they invade. They keep invading until we disappear. You know? All right, so, so you know, I think the answer is simple, give funds, give weapons and uh, start thinking about serious framework that can ensure security after this because there is no answer right now democracies can't produce a proper answer and the nato and uh, the united nations are you know are not capable of addressing this threat um yeah in the future you know once it's over i believe putin has to go because it will give an opportunity to so basically the strategy should be put as much pressure as possible in Russia so that there is internal fighting at the top level. And so the power and either Putin makes them guilty, you know, and, or he himself has to go. And that would give an opportunity to renegotiate the regime, you know, moving forward. But once that moment appears, it is important that people don't get completely complacent and don't forget that the problem is not individuals but the fact that russia has aggressive military regime so if it had if anyone has to be demilitarized it's russia they can be they can be an authoritarian regime that's to them we, i don't think it's our job to figure out for russians how to run their country but it's our job to make sure that they don't use their military to invade countries around them and I think once that opportunity will be there, and it will be there, it's like dark, you know, but it's going to get at some point, there will be a sunrise. And then there will be this opportunity to, to negotiate with Russia and put some conditions. And that's the time not to put in conditions on them that you have to be a democracy. That's up to them to figure out. We should not be babysitting other people. That's their job. Otherwise, they will not learn. You know, that's up to them. If they want to be a dictatorship, that's their job. But we need to make sure that they cannot invade other countries. So those should be the conditions. And I worry that the world will get the, will get the priorities wrong, that the world will go all into this, oh, let's make democratic elections in Russia, this and that, but let them keep their military at the level they have. And that's, that will be a huge mistake. That's what happened in 30 years ago. We tried to build democracies there and forgot to take the nukes away. And we failed in both. So, you know, um, yeah, that's how, that's the strategy, I guess, after the war. And right now put as much pressure on Russia as possible and give as much support to Ukraine as possible economically and militarily so that Russia regime collapses as soon as possible. And uh, I can talk substance why other solutions in my view are not possible, such as uh, negotiations, but because if we, there's no mechanism to enforce any deal with Russia. And furthermore, February 24 has destroyed that little trust that has been left in relationships with Russia. And so to build back that trust will take something extraordinary and the perception of current regime of people in power who have betrayed previous deals and promises will always stand in the way of building that trust. So in that sense, some change is needed there for the trust to be built eventually. And it probably will take decades, not years.
Thank you. Yeah, a very fair point. Thank you. And a very clear message of urgency. We need more weapon. We need to support the economy. But first, the war must end and we must stop Russia. So I think Andreas wanted to come in on the same, on the same point. Yes, I was actually making signals to Maria <laughs> to put me um, right after Timofey because um, I wanted actually to uh, continue on that what Timofey um, said and uh, elaborate on little, a little bit on why the West should support Ukraine and sanction Russia because I don't know how it's here in, in Sweden. I'm German and I know the German discussion better. What, what I often observe is this juxtaposition of on the one side, yes, our empathy for Ukraine is high. Yes, our solidarity for Ukraine is high. Here we have empathy and solidarity, but then we have also concerns about our own prosperity and our own security. Yeah, so, and usually this is then you have these sort of emotional idealist people who, who want, you know, support Ukraine, who uh, want to uh, justice and so on. And then you have this, the realists, yeah, who say, yeah, but, you know, we have our own interests, national interests, our own prosperity, our own security. And I think that's, um, that's often uh, the wrong way to go, at least as I see it now. I think there's now also the, the solidarity is, is going down because the, I would say, I mean, there are all these humanitarian issues, but I think the, the biggest scandal of this entire war is that not only that it is determined by the fact that Russia has nuclear weapons and or weapons of mass destruction and Ukraine doesn't. And the scandal about this, and, and everybody would, uh, all sides would, of course, um, behave differently if one of these things or both of these things would be different. Yeah. So if you imagine that Ukraine had nuclear weapons, or if you would imagine that Russia would not, not have nuclear weapons, or that, um, you know, then everybody would, Russia would behave, behave differently, Ukraine would behave differently, the West, the other countries would behave differently. So that, that is basically determining the, the entire situation. And the scandal about that is that Russia is permitted explicitly in perhaps the most important international treaty that exists, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, to have nuclear weapons. It's explicitly permitted to have these nuclear weapons. And Ukraine is explicitly forbidden to have these nuclear weapons. And most of you will know that of, the even more odd thing here is that Ukraine once had nuclear weapons. In fact, Ukraine had once uh, more nuclear warheads than uh, England, uh, Gross, uh, Great Britain, uh, France, and China taken together after the breakup of the Soviet Union. And it gave up these nuclear weapons, became a, um, a so-called non-nuclear weapon state, among others because of the Chernobyl experience, but also uh, on, on pressure not only from Russia, but also from the West, especially from the United States that was putting, uh, read for instance, the, um, memo, uh, the, the book by Stephen Pfeiffer, who was involved in these, uh, uh, American diplomat who was involved in these negotiations, uh, the Trident and the Eagle, where he de describes how this, um, um, uh, this uh, that, that was achieved. And I think what we have to, do, and so uh, Russia is, is violating here this um, non-proliferation regime. It's putting it, in, it on its head and it's making suggestions with every new day of this war to countries and politicians and experts and diplomats outside Eastern Europe outside Europe, all over the world, namely saying that, you know, at the end of the day, might is right. You cannot rely on international organizations. You cannot rely on international law. You cannot rely on security assurances, on all sorts of sweet talk by, from Washington or Brussels or Berlin and so on. You have to rely on yourself and you need the bomb if you want to be secure. And especially if you may have also interests in territories of neighboring countries, you may also want to have the bomb because you know Russia is now demonstrating that if you have the bomb, you can you can then actually use conventional forces to do whatever you want, and and the country that you attack will not get a no-fly zone from NATO or from somebody because everybody will be afraid of your bomb. Yeah, so that is the thing. 
the same goes for the UN, uh, for the United Nations, and especially for, for the UN Security Council. So Ukraine has been a founding member of the United Nations. The Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic was in 1945 one of the founding members of the United Nations. The Russian Federation was not a founding member of the Russian, of, of the United Nations. On 9th of December 1991, in a treaty, the so-called Belovesh Treaty, uh, the Soviet Union was officially dissolved. This is a, a ratified, officially re registered treaty, ratified by Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia, officially registered with the United Nations, which dissolved the Soviet Union. The Russian Federation is now a member of the United Nations and a member of the UN Security Council, although it has never applied to actually become a member of the United Nations and of the United, uh, of the Security Council. So this whole war is putting the entire international system on its head. And we should communicate this to our publics, that this is not only about Ukrainian children, this is about our children. And we should communicate to Russia that this is about our national interests, about our future, not the Ukrainian future. This is another country, which is in a sad situation, which we have feelings for, but our heads are about our children, our grandchildren. And we should also tell the Asian countries, the Latin American countries, the countries that are still trading with Russia, that this is a fundamental problem. And if we're gonna introduce finally at some point, I think we may have to come the secondary sanctions. We have to explain that, that this is not out of, of, out of solidarity and empathy for Ukraine. This is because of our own national interests. So that is, I think, the, the, that is the click that is still missing in the Western discourse. This, you know, um, we, need to, we need to, in a way, forget about Ukraine. We need to think about our own interests in, in this whole war. And then we may get to a different stage, both in the help for Ukraine and in the sanctioning of Russia. That was, was going to have another round on recovery. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much, Andreas. You're going to get the word back. I was I want to bring up the issue of sanctions because sanctions can be also another way to stop Russia. Or can they? Are sanctions effective? Maybe Torbjörn wants to come in the discussion on that. Seeing an effect of sanction is important also for the realist in Western in the Western world, as Andreas was mentioning. I'm now going to run the risk of both mansplaining. Natalia and Wes planning uh, Timofey. This is a little bit of an internal joke because uh, we had this discussion yesterday. And standing here, being who I am in Sweden, I obviously take a little bit of a different perspective. And Natalia and Timofey is living this daily. So you have to excuse me if I'm saying things that would have been said better by Natalia or Timofey. But yes, again, I, I think this idea that sanctions are not working, let, let's just start with that as, as the basis for this discussion. And this is also actually something that Maria has been writing about uh, herself. The first thing we have to remember is that sanctions are evaluated often by looking at the countries that are subject to sanctions today. And this is an important point Maria is, is making in a policy brief that we're not including in, in a lot of these studies all of the countries that did not take certain actions because they were afraid of the sanctions that would follow. So, you know, we should actually remember that what we're doing to Russia today is also sending a very clear signal to China, for example, with respect to Taiwan or to Iran or to other countries like that. You know, so we're not actually, again, only thinking about Ukraine and Russia, it's what we focus on here today, but the whole sanctions discussion needs to put, be put in a much wider framework, basically. So I think that's the first thing. The other thing is that, as Natalia was hinting, we get all of these official numbers now on how much is the Russian economy suffering because of sanctions. The latest IMF uh, forecast that came out uh, in October, uh, has a forecast of Russia declining maybe 4% this year. The Russian 
you know, central bank governor, Putin in Valdai, they're all sitting there saying, oh, sanctions don't matter, look how strong we are. We are so flexible. We have invented new ways of doing things. I'm sorry, but it's all bullshit. Uh, it, it really doesn't work that way. Russia has been discussing ways of, of getting off energy dependency since 1991, when we discussed market, uh, you know, how should Russia develop? Medvedev, when he became a president, the first thing he was discussing was basically modernization and diversification and, and all of these things. It still hasn't happened. The Russia GDP number, you can explain growth in Russia to maybe 75, 80% by just what's happening to international oil prices. One exogenous variable explains maybe 75% of Russia's growth. This is why sanctioning energy, trading with Russian energy is so important today. If we take this seriously, and also this discussion about putting a price cap on Russian oil is very central. This is the fundamental driving force of the Russian economy. It provides on average, maybe half of, of the revenues to the Russian budget, oil and gas, different taxes, etc. So of course, it's important to maintain sanctions and strengthen sanctions, and in particular to focus on not buying Russian energy at world market prices. It could actually be clever to let them sell, but at a much lower uh, price. That can alleviate some problems in poorer countries, to avoid sort of people in, in Africa or Asia becoming even poorer than they are today. So again, I think sanctions are still extremely important. And as Natalia also hinted at, I think we can do much more in terms of restricting what we're actually trading with Russia. I mean, now we have the principle, everyone have heard this idea of, of dual use technologies, basically a microchip that can either go into a computer or into a rocket, you know, dual use. But to be honest, a lot of the stuff that we're sending across borders could be dual use. The military forces would need food or clothes or regular, some car parts even, you know, all of these things. So the list becomes very long when you think about what is needed to, to actually uh, be involved in the war. So there are a lot of extra things we can do, but most importantly, we, we have to not sort of buy into the stupid narrative of saying that these sanctions are not hurting the Russian economy. It's clear if you're an economist, if you know what's going on in Russia, of course, they have learned how to deal with macroeconomic challenges because of all the crises they have handled over the last 20 years but they are definitely on a very steep outward trajectory in terms of economic development. And of course, uh, you know, you're not maybe fighting a war with your dollars or euros, but these are the things that determine how many tanks you can buy, how many rockets you can buy, how many soldiers you can pay to come from different countries to fight in Ukraine. So, the short answer is that we need to keep up the pressure uh, on the Russian economy, on the Russian financial system, and trade with Russia to basically limit its uh, prospects of, of being sort of successful uh, in the Ukrainian war, because that's not something any of us here would like to see. So I'll stop there. Now. Thank you. Then we can ask Natalia perhaps to complete. You have done a lot of work on sanctions with the Yermak McFall expert group. And what do you see that is still lacking? How can we complete the sanctions that are in place? But also perhaps, how can we broadcast more to our audiences that sanctions are working and the Russian economy is not doing so well after all? Yes, so uh, what Dornburn uh, said about energy, it's the elephant in the room and uh, uh, the devil again also in detail because and I think it's so on the one hand, there is already kind of embargo on Russian oil starting from December 5. 
and uh, then it's going to be even deeper from January and then this price cap, which is almost set. But uh, I think it's not still done deal because like several weeks ago, price cap was like $40, $55 leaked from the meetings. Now it's like more 60, 65. So if it will go to 80, you know, um, and uh, I think this uh, uh, question of what's going to be the price cap is very important. And uh, if it's going to be at the level of uh, 50, 55, then Russia can lose half of its export revenues from energy next year. And it means that they're going to be at kind of level of crisis that they faced in the previous years, in 2008, for example, or during COVID. But if it's something closer to 65, 70, then for Russia, it will be like much smaller uh, decrease and this kind of uh, I don't know like the, why it happens like that uh, to the full but when they have 150 billion revenues or less from export of energy they get into what is called crisis for them and when they are not below this or at this point they can handle so I think this uh, uh, level of price cap gonna be a big difference uh but otherwise i agree that russia should be isolated more fully and uh, my dream case scenario is that it's gonna it should be like with iran for their friends right now uh when at the worst times for iran where it was only one bank who was and it wasn't even on the territory of iran who was allowed to make transactions uh, with them, I think it's something towards what kind of we should be moving with Russia, because unfortunately, many ways to find more control of the transactions. Uh, I think. It, there will be more and more stories like we have with Iran right now and with their drones coming up more. Thank you, Natalia. So uh, when this fine day comes and we can drink champagne and the war is over, Russia is defeated then, can we think a little bit about reconstruction? How, how do we best organize it? I think I would like to ask both Andreas and Turbjörn that have thought about this a lot and talk to people to describe how do you see this uh, uh, described in the West? How do people in the West think about this? And then maybe we can ask the Ukrainian perspective of this as well, on this as well. Who wants to start? Well, in a way, I'm the least qualified <laughs> because I'm a political scientist and not economist. But um, I'm, maybe I'll, I'll say some things for, for, uh, from the uh, political science uh, sort of uh, um, perspective. Um, I think that has been already now um, in the air. I don't know what the Ukrainian colleagues um, think about it, that um, to a certain degree, um, the reconstruction and the flow of money will be not determined by Ukraine, but by the donors. And it will not be something similar to the Marshall Plan, but rather, which was a, where one country supported many countries but here it will be many countries hopefully supporting one country and each each of this country each of the institutions may have its own ideas about how to channel the money how to use the money and um, it's going to be a difficult um, um, process to negotiate that and um, i've been myself um, and that's why maybe i'm a little bit qualified to to um, uh, to comment on that uh, a part of a German um, developmental program in Ukraine and um, they have their own traditions, um, you know, like CEDA has in, in, in Sweden, the uh, USAID in, in, in the US, GIZ in Germany and so on. There, there, there are certain, uh, certain lines, so to, so, so to say, that have been established and there may be not as much innovation sometimes um, as as maybe maybe necessary so i think that may be one of the of the 
so far perhaps less discussed problems. And I think what, what is needed here, um, uh, as far as I can see, to make clear from the Ukrainian side or also from pro-Ukrainian speakers is that there also needs to be some contingency funding, there needs to be some basic funding for the state to, to develop, and it cannot be all left to the sort of old schemes of the, um, the sort of pre war schemes of the, of the develop, developmental organizations that have their algorithms of doing that, but, but this is a post-war or war situation still uh, that, uh, that ma makes it special. And the other thing that is, of course, here very special about Ukraine is um, the difficulties with um, uh, private investment, and again, I'm, I'm not going to comment that here from the economic uh, viewpoint, but rather the sort of political aspect of it, that this has been, in fact, an issue already discussed for a while. Um, the insurance of foreign direct investment has been, to my knowledge, for the first time mentioned by George Soros in May, March 2014, not, not 2022, March 2014, um, in an article in the Guardian, where he where he already saw this as a as a key problem for Ukraine, the how how do you how do you make sure that private investors will be coming to Ukraine in this uh, during this conflict with uh, with Russia, and um, uh, and I guess that has to be taken care of. I think that's going to be maybe the most complicated, um, uh, as far as I can see, issue in all of that. How to um, how to attract uh, or make it make it possible for uh, private investors to, to come because I, I suppose but again the, the economists here will know better that it cannot be all done by by public money and from the sort of political point of view what what ukraine here also needs is um security um some sort of security not only for the security of living but also uh, for uh, providing securities so to say then to the to the economy and there are three basic uh, schemes here to do that, uh, to provide security for, for the Ukrainian state, the Ukrainian people, the Ukrainian economy, and perhaps also for uh, foreign investors, that the first one and the easiest one and the most preferred one is uh, an accession uh, to NATO. Um, that is uh, the, the most uh, sort of uh, mostly discussed issue also in, in Sweden nowadays. Um, so. Um, uh, and my feeling is that we may be actually closer to a serious discussion of this issue that um, um, that some people think. So I've just been to a, to a conference in Vilnius where people were remembering how the decision to include the Baltic countries in in NATO, how how short the time between this decision and the actual then accession of um, of the um, Baltic countries was and and. And how suddenly this appeared, and that in the mid 1990s, that was still something totally out of, you know, out of the discussion. And then in 2004, all, all three of them, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, became members. So I think that that discussion needs to be needs to continue, and there may uh, appear then at some point uh, a window of opportunity. But until then, Ukraine needs some sort of security guarantees from uh, countries that are ready to provide them. And you know, then the question would be basically to every country that supports Ukraine, what kind of security guarantee it can provide or which kind of collective security agreement it may be able to enter with, uh, with Ukraine. For instance, we had the statement of nine East European, um, Central East European countries that supported uh, Ukraine's uh, application for NATO that may be also then countries that may provide may be able to provide security guarantees. That would be the intermarium concept. If you've ever heard of that, that's an old in concept from the interwar period when already the countries that came out of the different empires in Central Eastern Europe were thinking about their security and were thinking about creating an alliance of these new countries between Germany and the Soviet Union to uh, make themselves uh, more secure. Or the, the third concept that is now being discussed, and maybe that's the most realistic and most easy to implement, is what is called in, in Ukraine, big Israel, or what may be also called in political science, armed neutrality, so that Ukraine would become militarily so strong that it can provide for its own security. And that's why also these weapons um, issue is not only important for, for the war, it's also important for the peace, because you you, you if you don't get this sort of basic sense of security in the country, that is also an enormous economic problem. Uh, and somehow it has to, has to be provided either by NATO or by, by uh, 
security guarantees from other countries or organizations or by simply arming Ukraine to a sufficient degree that it can actually defend its territory, its cities, uh, its factories. Thank you, Andreas. Urbjorn. Yes, I guess uh, both uh, Timofey and myself, we were involved in the CPR report to discussing uh, reconstruction of Ukraine. The work was led by uh, Yuri Garnyshenko, who is, of course, also a KEC alumni. Um, but, you know, already then we were discussing that we may need to think about reconstruction in phases that starts already while war is going on in parts of Ukraine. We can't really wait to get some housing, critical infrastructure in place until you know, Russia decides not to fire more missiles at Ukraine. So, you know, we need to think uh, a little bit more, you know, forthcoming about what can we do today uh, in different parts of Ukraine. And, and, you know, we cannot really sit on the fence and, and wait for, for this war to be over completely. The other thing is, of course, like Andreas was mentioning, there's going to be a lot of different countries who wants to contribute uh, funds and, and skills, et cetera, in this process. So in the report we wrote with this team from CPR, we are arguing that we think, because also the second part of the title of today is become a successful member of the EU, which is sort of the, the longer term goal here, I think. Um, we should think about an institution with very strong ties to the EU, uh, that coordinates the donor side. We should not have, you know, Germans, Swedes, Americans, French, all of them running around in Kiev asking for meetings with Timofey, Natalia, the presidential administration. We need to get together in one room all at the sort of once, sit down and make these plans together. That's going to be uh, a critical part of also then tackling what a lot of people here. Uh, are are worried about, which is sort of corruption and misuse of funds. So we we coordinate these things. We make a common plan that the Ukrainian government sort of tells us about, and then we can have a monitoring system together with the Ukrainian government to see that all of these things that we're discussing are actually uh, implemented in in the best possible way. Because people in Ukraine are tired of corruption and taxpayers in the West complain about these things. So we're doing everyone a favor by just removing that possibility of, of misuse and funds if we are ready to coordinate uh, between the donors uh, much more forcefully. Um, all right, I'm, I'm going to stop here and, and let Natalia and, and Timofey probably chip in. So what the recovery. So some of the issues that are commonly mentioned and that Turbin also mentioned are the like balancing coordination between different donors with a more pragmatic approach of letting everybody continue on their partnerships and whatever they can contribute with, balancing ownership in Ukraine with necessity of control and over oversight, also the issues of corruption and so on. What is your view on this? All right, so so there are, I just can share my experiences. One is that um, everyone wants to be the in control of recovery. It's just amazing, you know, like um, every agency out there, although the IMF are smart, they said, no, not our mandate. But everyone else is kind of setting up a fund or setting up a platform or people are trying to, you know, go to conferences and set up a uh, reputation for themselves that they can lead. You know, actually there are a lot of people who want to be leaders of this fund or something. It's, it's the typical career driven politics in, and, and organizational politics. The organizations have their mandate and they want to get funding. There's a lot of uh, funds potentially. Um, this is counterproductive because it really creates this uh, exacerbates to an extreme almost um, those inefficiencies which we see 
in uh, international development aid when the mandates and territories are not clearly defined. And they are not clearly defined because none of the IFIs or institutions or domestic agencies or ministries or anyone is set up to be the platform, the ministry or something for reconstruction. That's one thing. The second thing I think, whatever the governance structure will be, the people who are running it on the international side have to be in Kyiv. You know, many of IFIs, the IMF is running uh, the mission from Vienna, the World Bank uh, doesn't have an office in Ukraine. They're writing assessment reports, they're, you know, suggesting how things, but they are not there actually. And, you know, some things, I don't want to like be frivolous about this, but, you know, you have to experience certain things in order to be able to assess them and estimate. And this is not a conceptual statement. It's a simple statement on October 10th when there were missile attacks on infrastructure two, two hours after the missiles were in, the city was up and running. If you, you just simply don't get this feel how people respond to it. And that's a valuable information, you know, how quickly infrastructure, you won't be able to get it in numbers when saying, oh, you know, 450,000 people were out of flight and two hours after that they were, well, but the people offered, you know, like people were killed and half an hour after that coffee shops are working, you know, they put, uh, you know, they boarded up the windows and they opened for business. And you get, you have to get this feel, you know, uh, in order to be able, there's so much institutional detail. And uh, by the time you get a report on this, that's going to be two weeks if you're lucky or two months on ever, you know, like how quickly October 10 shock to infrastructure was adjusted. And you probably, you have to make a lot of decisions between October 10 and those two months when you get a report about where to, they, you know, allocate your resources. So you have to have, uh, you have to have leadership and uh, expertise in Kiev, whatever it will be this uh, reconstruction agency. I think that was also the case for the Marshall Plan, right? The, 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 the decision-making was in Germany. It was not run from other capitals. You know, it wasn't run from London or from Washington. It was run from the ground. The, you, you, you know, you go for coffee, you build relationships. It's, it's much more complete information. So I think that's important. So one is to try to somehow overcome this career concerns where everyone wants to, you know, like the World Bank is setting up their fund, the EBRD, the EU, like everyone is trying to, you know, be the leader and look good. That's going to get in the way. So coordination, there should be a platform. And so far, there hasn't been a platform. There have been Lugano meeting, has been Berlin meeting now. There's like, there's always this talk about corruption. It's an important talk. But that's not an excuse to do nothing in terms of coordination, okay? So if we talk about corruption and governments, then we have to make offers and propositions that, you know, okay, corruption is an issue. Yes, corruption is an issue. And especially in a war time, we can look up the investigation reports on corruption in Iraq or Afghanistan. I'm not bringing back the history of Ukraine or anything like that prior to 2014. That's going to be an issue. But again, that's not an excuse to do nothing. You know, they, it's, it's a reason to offer specific infrastructure, how to, you know, I would like to hear the words about audit and benchmarking and, you know, pilots and authorized developers or, you know, some criteria based on, you know, procurement mechanisms rather than talk about corruption. You know, corruption is specific. Is it done through procurement? Or is it done because benchmarking is wrong? No? Or is it done because you actually procure but things don't get done and they are not audited and things have not been built? So, you know, what is that? Then, of course, Ukraine has to, you know, has to do several reforms in my view. One is lobbying laws. We, you know, we have been fighting corruption in Ukraine, but we, like, we somehow feel that if we helicopter, it's arrogant. I think you, they, they believe that if we helicopter 
uh, US, European, or you know, Australian institutions to Ukraine, they will work. Using this analogy of teenagers, democracy, it assumes away the dynamics. It says, oh, you know, I know how an adult would behave, so I'm gonna demand the same thing from it's just the adult doesn't know i have to put more pressure on teenager to behave as an adult no the teenager has to grow through this right it will take time and often it is important that it is the teenager who grows not that it you know the parents are overly protective over him or her it's a teenage democracy it has to grow it's a, a corruption and inefficiency it's a political economy problem first and then institutional problem second. Political economy means that if you do not have an answer to the question how politi political campaigns are financed, then you should not be surprised there will be corruption, right? If you know it takes to get to an office $10 million if you're lucky or maybe 100, you know, with, with commercials and advertisement and people in the field and things like that, and of course, there's no way in Ukraine where you can demonstrate or trace $10 million, you know, coming into someone's campaign because there's no law, it would be illegal and things, you know, things like that. Then why are you surprised that there would be corrupt officials? We can impose more, you know, this uh, anti-corruption infrastructure and put more people in prison, but that doesn't change anything. You have to pay for a political commercial when you campaign. And someone is going to offer to pay for you. And if you are naive or not naive, if you are not naive, you know you're risking a prison later. If you're naive, you don't understand what's going on, but you will nonetheless get an office. And then they, they, you, they will present you with a bill. So you actually have to have a political campaign reform. You have to have a lobbying reform where lobbying is legalized. And not it's the old Soviet Union style legislation it has to be legalized. And then you need to actually make sure that there is a further separation between the state and regulation and how people earn money. You know, there are three ways. One is procurement. Procurement has been cleaned up more or less in Ukraine. It's electronic procurement, won many, many awards. Some other countries can look up and learn from that. Not ideal, but much better than in many other places. Central bank where we get, you know, essentially, uh, the central bank finances specific banks and they you know finance specific they issue loans to preferred clients that has been cleaned up in 2014 2017 and the third one is regulatory distortions where you change the tariffs or you change the pricing somewhere or you impose licensing entry barriers so the barriers the regulator so for that and you you essentially create monopolies that can capture like energy monopoly, sometimes natural monopoly, sometimes not. That's there, that's in Ukraine. So now we have a specific conversation. We're asking where are the oligarchs today? They're in energy, they're in natural monopolies, they're somewhere there. That's where corruption potentially is because they want to protect their rents. How do we address that? We, we run a, we, we create a strong comp competition authority, anti-monopoly committee. In the same way we have done it in 2014, 2016 with the central bank. A strong, powerful, competent, independent regulator has been able to work miracles in Ukraine. On the first day of the war, the banks were running. There were no bank rents on the first day of the war. Bombings, jets are flying, up. people standing in ATMs, drawing cash. There was enough cash. The there were no bank rents in Ukraine. Can give me a country where on the day of the war, there's no bank rents. So here's a success story. Ukraine can do it with a clear focus on what needs to be done, structural reform. So we have to do competition authority, we have to do um, political campaign and lobbying reforms. And after that, there'll be pressure to create proper judicial reform. It will be coming from businesses. So that has to be a design and that things could be addressed and some conditionality or not, but we have to stop talking about, oh, you know, there's corruption and start talking specifics. And then if we are concerned about corruption during the beginning of recovery period, then there is a simple answer, you know, the government can offer what it wants to be built because in the beginning, there'll be a rapid rebuilding, right? It's not gonna be investment in some venture capital kind of, it's gonna be built housing. 
we know what the price of a square meter of a house is today. It's very difficult, you know, and we know how to verify the quality of the house. So then we should talk about audit. The government of Ukraine wants to build it. Okay, there is funding, verify that it has been built. That's actually simple. If someone can, uh, you know, the government can make a bid and say we are willing, or Ukrainian companies were willing to build it at this price. If someone can build uh, at a lower price, well, please, right? So you can run an auction in procurement who can build cheaper. But I, I've been in, you know, I've seen this rebuilding already. The overheads the US or sometimes some British companies are taking are higher than the corruption rents that people are taking in Ukraine. They are legal, but they are higher. So let's legalize the rents in Ukraine and you know be done with it. I mean, I'm being, of course, don't take it. I'm not serious in terms of we have. But what I mean is that sometimes if you start thinking in terms of square meters that you can build per dollar, you have a very different conversation. You start talking about how this uh, gray market or shadow, or, you know, semi-corrupt companies, how you can make them clean, how you can make them auditable, how you can make them financeable, how you can move them out of the gray zone into, into you know, properly, fully compliant zone. And then you, you'll say, okay, you can build twice cheaper, but you are not auditable because you're running here with some bribes. And then these guys will say, but we need to give bribes, otherwise we won't get permits. And then you have an answer the way you need to clean up and do a reform. So all of this, you know, there, it, I, I don't subscribe to this, that behind every corruption, there is a name. I, can, I subscribe to the issue between every corruption case, there is a political economy problem. And we need to engineer it and reverse engineer it and remove it. That has been done in Ukraine. Eight years ago, our police were, you know, I used this example earlier, our police was shooting at our protesters, our citizens in 2014. Eight years later, today, we are resisting and successfully to the second largest army in the world. That's gross. That's state building in eight years. Fully corrupt police shooting its own citizens on pro-Russian premises because the president has decided to abandoned the pro-European move into the country resisting a full-blown invasion by Russia. So Ukraine can change and is changing and has changed. So when we talk about corruption, that's a wrong narrative. I, I am, I'm, it's an important narrative, but I think we can move towards understanding what the political economy issue, where the con competition is lacking, how to remove barriers, and what is the design of the reforms. And I think that will be done. So in that sense, I'm more concerned about the sense of urgency disappearing once the war is over. Because right now, everyone wants to help Ukraine. But once the war will be over, people will not be dying anymore. The fact that 30% of population doesn't have housing, it will be like another country. Okay? That is my bigger concern. Rather than the governance, my concern is will there be will because the danger from pragmatic perspective is that if Ukraine is not economically successful, there'll be a, an opportunity for populist government to come to power, which will weaken Ukraine and will create again a temptation for Russia to try to come in and establish dominance, maybe in a political way. So Ukraine has to be rebuilt so it has strong economy and people there are happy. And the narrative that you see Europeans betrayed you anyway after the war doesn't have a chance. Of course, it's not going to be like that, but Russia will try to use that narrative. They will try. So that narrative shouldn't have a chance. And then Ukraine has to have a strong economy so it can defend itself. Because stronger Ukraine means more secure Ukraine and more secure Europe. So, so basically, these are my remarks on re recovery. Yes, okay. let me ask a follow-up question. When you're talking about reforms and uh, Ukraine growing into their own institutions, how important is the prospect of EU membership? And we connect to the second part of the title here. And also with the 
thinking about the disappointment that there is right now about the EU. How do you see this in the future? What will happen should uh, things not play out as expected in terms of EU membership? So Ukraine will be a member of EU um, when I cannot say, but uh, there is no ideology left or right or conservative or liberal or something like that in Ukraine. If you look at the history of politics in Ukraine, there are two, two, two ideologies, pro-Russian and pro-EU. Not pro-US, by the way, even though I would be pro-US, but I've been trained in the US, so I have a bias. It's pro-EU. It's a choice. It's really, you can put people on pro-EU or pro-Russia. And the pro-Russia faction is gone. So we will have all the, you know, more traditional, more standard, I would say, ideological distribution. But for now, it was pro-EU and or pro-Russia. Pro That's the ideology. This is the strongest force there is in terms of fundamental pulling force for Ukraine to change. It's a force of gravity. The EU is the center of gravity for Ukraine. Ukraine wants to become European. We want to be recognized as Europeans. We want to say that we deserve to be European, that we are fighting for European values. There are all these arguments and senses. People were killed in 2014 because the protests were to have a EU association agreement. So people paid in lives. And now about Russia, it's also about EU versus Russia. So that's a fundamental force which will change Ukraine for the better and also has been changing Ukraine for the better over the last 30 years. And it can also be used strategically to leverage the changes needed both, you know, in our relate in the EU relationship with Ukraine, Ukraine relationship with the EU, and in Ukraine itself. That's very powerful. That's really the gravity. So there is this war, and then the EU. These are two fundamental forces. If you want to understand Ukraine, that's basically how we should think about it. If we have some kind of a failure, we don't win, then this the EU, you know, we become Russian occupied, whether fully or partly, people will die, will suffer, you know. So we are fighting for against Russia because we are part of Europe. That's how it feels in Ukraine. Might not feel that way here, but that's how it feels in Ukraine. That's the politics, that's the domestic politics. And so our politicians will respond to these forces. Desire for freedom and desire to be Europeans. They will not be able to change it if, you know, if the EU supports us. Something drastic has to happen. We would have to feel betrayed for things to start working different. Although we do feel betrayed about the Budapest Memorandum, a little bit, to put it nicely. Yeah. Thank you again. Our time is almost over, but I want to ask our audience if there is any burning question. Thank you. Uh, very briefly, my name is Hans Korell, and I was the Under Secretary General for Legal Affairs and the Legal Council of the United Nations between 94 and 2004, three years at Butos Gali and seven years at Ljubljana. I was involved in the establishment of all the present existing war crimes tribunals, and we see now a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council committing the most horrendous crimes, including the crime of aggression. The International Criminal Court does not have jurisdiction over their crime, and therefore I have, together with the first prosecutor of the Sierra Leone Tribunal and uh, uh, Aaron Kotler, former Minister of Justice for Canada, proposed a draft statute for a tribunal on the crime of aggression against Ukraine. And I know that President Zelensky has handed it over to a number of ambassadors, and they are now sounding the Travis uh, atmosphere in the United Nations General Assembly uh, for that. Let me also add very briefly that there is available on the web a guide for politicians on the rule of law. 
if you take down the words, rule of law, a guide for politicians, you will find it. It's only some 40 pages and it doesn't cost anything. It is available both in Ukrainian and in Russian. And I wonder, Mr. Former Minister, if I could have a word with you after this session. Thank you. Are there any questions for our guests before we close? Yes. Thank you very much. Excellent discussion. My name is Elena Zubkovich, Director of Nordic Ukraine Forum. Um, I totally agree that sanctions work, and so when if they were not uh, efficient, uh, Russia would not have uh, used the disinformation, those strong disinformation, to spread the world the word about this. And secondly, about the uh, also about the efficiency, uh, I've been to Ukraine just recently to Kiev and uh, to to oh, Kiev Oblast, and I've seen incredible. Um, creativity and efficiency there. For example, there was a shell into the uh, almost to the city center. And the next day, uh, the road where the, uh, the missile has fallen down was already reconstructed. It's, it's incredible. Moreover, I've, I've been to Bucha and to Hostomel, and I've seen that uh, many, uh, many buildings been reconstructed as well. So um, Ukraine works very fast. And we see that it, it can do incredible things very, very, um, in a very, uh, brief timing. Um, and finally, I would um, like to mention that um, uh, we should think about the, the, the topic is about the future as well, and the future of Ukraine relates to the future of Russia. Uh, we do not talk much about this, but however, uh, the disintegration of Russia is one of most, uh, most uh, evident uh, um, how to say um, possible plans for it. We don't want to talk about this. We don't want to think about Chechnya, Tatarstan, and so on, but um, but there are not many um, issues why Russia should stay as it is. So um, thank you very much for the excellent, uh, excellent discussion. Thank you for a contribution from the audience as well. Do you have any last words, <laughs> our panelists? Then I, yeah, Natalia. Yeah, just uh, thank you for both comments. And uh, I, I want maybe to reiterate uh, to Irina uh, right about uh, the future of Russia. Uh, I think we have a, a small coalition here with Timothy and we really believe that Russians should finally start taking care of them on their own and not waiting for someone to come up with something so that kind of scenario is a nice thing to do but in any way like we think that's uh, the way to go and uh, thank you very much also about your comments we didn't talk about it today too much about the accountability and compensation of damages but that's a big deal and maybe this kind of war could have also not less than sanctions kind of effect on russian behavior because uh, eventually what they do, they violate the all international laws. And uh, what and it, they shouldn't be allowed to do it and they should pay and be accountable for that. So thank you for the comment. We, we would really want to continue this. Torbjörn so wanted to also say some closing words. Yes, I would be an extremely bad host to our friend from Kiev if, if I forgot to mention that all of their work basically is about fundraising for good causes in Ukraine, but not for themselves. So here in Stockholm, we started Friends of KC. That's actually fundraising for KC so they can continue this important work. So I would just suggest that you go and check out. There's a website called friendsofkac.org. And it's very easy to make your own contributions uh, to the school and make sure that they continue their good work. So uh, with this, I'm done. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you all. Our panelists and you audience for participating. Uh, let's keep supporting Friends of KSC and KSC and Ukraine.